Mr. Roberts, a primary school teacher, asks his class of eight-year-olds their desired career choice for when they get older, become adults. Add the whole 20 years onto your life, he says, and let the sky be your limit. Tommy, you go first. Give me your gold. Okay, sir. Wait a minute. Yeah, I got it. I want to be rich. And how exactly do you plan on achieving this, Tommy? Questions Mr. Roberts, half inquisitive, half dismissive. I don't know, Tommy and Vince, I just want to be rich. Okay. Laura can see this. You next. What occupation is top of your wish list? Well, sir, Laura says with concentrated thought in her eyes that strays from the floor to all four classroom corners. I want to be a homeless musician. She bellows out loud expecting to be immediately dismissed, and she is. As the whole class laugh out loud at this, the poorest choice of rich list occupations there is. You see, sir, I saw a strange man strumming strings in the street last Saturday. He performed this beautiful assortment of mellifluous chords, and in his eyes loud the wonders of the world, and in his words loud the wonders that the human brain could ever imagine, that my ears had ever heard. His voice, a final furlong from boss. Fingers, coarse. Fedora bore a long time before the guitar, authentic. He sang as if a worry had never troubled him, as if it's the rest of us that fails to fit in, and the best of it is he wasn't busking for pittance. No, sir, he gave me back the two pound coin I attempted to give him, and told me to make a wish which ticked the boxes of my soul, which instinctively ignited a passion in me, sir, a passion that turns pain and hurt into flames of mirth in an instant. But homeless, Laura, wouldn't you prefer to be a musician who could retire to a stable home, perhaps with a mortgage, a resort where you can climb into bed at the end of the day and know there's no shortage of warmth? Of course not, sir. You're clearly missing a point here. How can I experience and fully appreciate the delights of nature with paper walls and a roof in between us? How can I move into tomorrow with unpredictability when freedom is restricted by security? No. I prefer to live far less expensive, which I accept could prove more costly in the long term. And as for safety, highly overrated, so a stately home based on the lake district, distinctly overlooking the same mundane scenery, would be lost on me, sir. Two stations for my liking. Enlightening, Laura. And what about the brutal freezes of winter? Strengthens the mind, sir. And what about starting a family? There'll be plenty of time for that, sometime after. And hygiene? I'll happily shiver on the banks of a rolling river if needs be. As long as I'm free, it's nothing short of easy to me, sir. Please believe me. Okay, Laura. But just so you know, there's nothing stopping you from being a teacher like me. I would be teaching, sir, but my teaching would be voiced in a completely different capacity. No curriculum, I just teach peace and love. And as long as I touch one person's heart, I know it'll reach those stars above. Just peace and love, sir. Just peace and love. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, last year, I was asked by Apples and Snakes, like the largest poetry organisation in this country, and they asked like nine of us from all over the country to go to London and, and write and perform a, a poem of what we think spoken words can be like in um, 30 years from now. So it was their 30th, 30th birthday, and they were saying, okay, so what do you think it's going to be like in 30 years from now? And um, for those that you have performed, or for those that you have write spoken word poetry, call it what you will, it's a, fan it's a fantastic time to get involved in it now. Massive, 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 massive at the moment. You have people like Polar Bear from, uh, from Birmingham, who's just released a book. Jodie Ann Bickley, I think it's the bestseller at the moment, a uh, million love letters. Then you have um, Nathan, I can't remember his surname, that was a, a bestseller as well. George the Poet was on... Um, What's that late night with Jules, Jules Holland a few months ago? This is all poetry, you know, all stems from spoken words, moving to different avenues, but it's a fantastic time at the moment, it's a great way. But yeah, so I uh, wrote a poem, wrote a poem. Is it written or wrote or written like, oh, I think, I don't know, I'm not quite sure. Does anyone know? Wrote a poem, wrote a poem. I have written a poem. I have written a poem, well, that's quite cool, yeah. Hang on, stick with that. I have written a poem. Yeah, so it's what uh, spoken words have been like in 2042. And that's more or less the title. 
Um, yeah. And eternity is gone. And here we stand, leering into the future, beckoning it on. Edging towards the pond to skim dreams across, wishing through the fog. Sifting through the literature to deliver to the lost. To ask questions of the found. To entertain them all. We never left this bread and circus life. Simply waited for more to climb aboard. And in time, plenty more will do. Because in 2042, spoken word will enlighten the frightened masses. An empty thought won't do. It will successfully merge the perturbed and famished with a platform to stand on, to express their hurt and anguish, and the world will stand still and listen. It will be far larger than any one religion, and will help us to acknowledge our differences, and call for more to bridge them, call for all to listen to a story the unfortunate are living. Spoken word will give hope to those that choke on words unscripted. Every child will be lifted towards the sky before they look behind and realise it's on the shoulders of poetry they're sitting. The knowing is in the vision. Weaponry will be forbidden by imperialists and freedom fighters alike. Instead, poetry will be recited on the front line. No tyrants, no violence, no domestic riots or festive sirens, no fears, no tears, no years of loved ones dying at least to an annual two minute silence. In 2042, I see homeless men bellowing out extracts from De Profundis. Drunken 20-something young ladies bumping into each other before choosing to exchange Shakespearean phrases instead of resorting to thumping one another. I see small boys encouraged by their fathers to learn off by heart the poem If by Woody R. Kipling. Then modernising in school we break dance in a beep, 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 beep box in a seat oak trees with William Blake verses carved into them, instead of I heart Richard. Pictures of Lord Byron adorned on a myriad of teenage bedroom walls as a port of call for reference. Cardboard cutouts of Charles Bukowski strategically placed in upstairs windows to scare off potential intruders and unwanted family members. I see purists longing for the past, asking, whatever happened to paperback books? I then see the large majority of people starting to educate themselves on the history of spoken word through paperback books. In fact, I see middle-aged backpackers and school back preparing parents packing pen, paper, and more importantly, paperback books. I see spoken word performances perfected and utilised as verbal armaments to add conviction to domestic arguments. Manipulation of the arts in abundance. I see members of parliament studying archaic clips of Buddy Wakefield footage to see how they can get their feeble points across more convincingly. I see prison officers shouting, repeat after me, Stop, start, staccato, inflection piece, metaphors preferred over similes, understand the impact of syntax, you're now ready for your court appeal, please go and set yourself free, freedom, for the one time illiterate, proud mothers filling up as they witness their children deliver with diligence, spoken words, to reinvigorate all from vigilant villagers to city figures that linger in ignorance. With the whole world still listening up. Nine billion poetic souls clinging to peace and love. Now wouldn't that be something? Ah oh, shit, I'm daydreaming again. Okay, that's enough. Thanks. <laughs>